The last time we were talking about the fact that uh, when St. Pius X succeeded to the papal throne, succeeded Pope Leo XIII in 1903, he, as well as Cardinal Neri del Val, appreciated the potential of Pacelli in the promotion of Vatican interests and frequently called upon him to perform various tasks and frequently sought his opinion. So St. Pius X eventually made uh, Murray del Val a cardinal, uh, who probably would have succeeded uh, St. Pius X in one of the later conclaves, the one that actually elected Pius XI, uh, but was unable to get enough votes, which resulted in the election of, of Achille Ratti, who became Pius XI. So he was, if he had in fact become pope later on, he would have been very much along the same lines as St. Pius X, which would have been excellent. And there was that conclave was due to swing back towards the anti-accommodationists after the reign of Benedict XV, but it didn't quite make it. It didn't swing back all the way as they were supposed to. And then with Pius XII, well, see, things went all the way back towards the accommodationists uh, to the point of really being the threshold of Vatican II, which we'll see. But also, as we said, that is not in any way due to any modernism personally on the part of Eugenio Pacelli, certainly not, uh, because we said that in, the in the Secretariat of State, he worked very closely with Monsignor uh, Umberto Benigni, who was vigorously anti-modernist and had, and had among his contacts the Sodalitium Pianum, remember St. Pius X's agency, as it were, for keeping tabs on modernists who had, uh, as we also said, a, a list of all the cardinals. So I will, edit, I will scan that list and send it out it's very soon. So among other things, Pacelli collaborated with Gaspari in the crucial drafting of the Codex Juris Canonici from 1904 to 1917, assuming, assuming the bulk of the burden, which was much appreciated by the cardinal. So this is, remember, uh, before uh, the, the First, the commission of the Code of Canon Law uh, and then its promulgation. Uh, there were, in fact, uh, many laws in the Church, uh, but there was no one really uh, official compilation of everything. And that was the idea with the Code of Canon Law, was to put everything in, in one place, in, under one binding. At least all of the, the, the major rules. Yes, there were various decrees. Uh, for example, it's, it's the Code of Canon Law specifically did not uh, uh, say uh, uh, did not do away with any of the decrees of the Sacred Congregation of Rights, for example. So the canon law left many things purposely in place, the Code of Canon Law, the 1917 Code. Uh, but it was also um, much more condensed than what had been in place before, which was called the, something called the Corpus Juris Canonici, the, the body of canon law. Because prior to that, there were many laws of the Church, there have been various different ways of promulgating laws of the church, and they had all been, in a sense, all in different file drawers and and uh, under piles of papers on the desk and things like that. And it was it was relatively difficult to determine uh, what the laws of the church actually were on certain points. Uh, so in the code of canon law, the idea with that was to put put it on one binding as much as possible and to make it uh, and and to condense it, which is certainly as yes, to the fact to the point that certain things. Uh, perhaps need to be filled out a bit. But uh, you, you see this, uh, the, the 1917 code sometimes being referred to as the new code of canon law in, in, in authors who, who are, whose works were published after its promulgation, which sounds funny to us because it usually referred to the new code of canon law. That means JP2 is 1983 code that, uh, that, that uh, incorporates Vatican II. And so it is a little funny sometimes to come across these see the new code. Why is Merkelbach talking about the new code? No, okay, really, no. That's, that's the code of canon law. Because certain things were changed. Certain things were changed in, when, in the 1917 code compared to what had been in place before. Uh, it's mostly, to, to, to a very great extent, things are kept the same. The idea was not to overhaul everything, uh, not to change every little thing, but to, to organize it, to, to, to put it all in one official volume. Which it did, uh, and in fact, if you see a code of canon law, I don't have a copy of it on me right now. But uh, it says it's a it's a book maybe that thick. Just compare that to the <laughs> the many many volumes say of federal law, 
That's a very short list of rules, all things considered, by which the entire Catholic Church is ruled. All of that. So, um, yes, there are other decrees, other things to take into account. There were de subsequent decrees by congregations giving the authentic interpretation of the code, that is, the, uh, the congregation assigned to clarifying things specifically for that purpose, to do that in an authoritative way. But that was all done, yes. Uh, commissioned by St. Pius X, 1904, one of his earliest uh, decisions, one of the earliest things he did was to set that up. Let, let's, let's codify canon law. Let's make Let's, let's clean this up a bit, and then was promulgated by Pope Benedict XV in 1917. So you have Cardinal Gaspari involved here, uh, an expert canonist, uh, definitely had certain, certain problems. He was not the, the greatest character, but he was definitely an expert canonist. We have certain works of his in, in the library, and he was very good in that. And also Pacelli here, who see, has a definite, has a training for and a, and a talent for legal matters. So convinced of Pacelli's ability and reliability, in 1908, St. Pius X sent him to London once again, this time to attend the 19th Eucharistic Congress. So that should be Eucharistic Congress in the notes. And so Eucharistic Congress is um, it's a, a, great, a great act of devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. So uh, they, they were typically very well attended, and you know, even thousands of people would come to Eucharistic Congresses. And uh, some interesting things to note concerning those, it was sometimes what happened that there were so many people coming from all over the world for such things that popes would sometimes uh, uh, give faculties to any priest who happened to be there to absolve from any reserved sin. Uh, because you have so many people coming from all over the place, you have no idea um, what sins may need to be uh, absolved among those who might come. Because they had many, many priests, there'd be a priest hearing confessions all the time. And there are, indeed, the church can uh, grant faculties to a priest to hear confessions in general, but not allow the certain, uh, say, priests without uh, uh, certain special faculties to absolve certain sins. And typically those would be posted in churches before Vatican II. If you need to have a list of sins posted outside the confessional, uh, specify if you need to have any of these sins absolved, you cannot receive absolution here have to go to a higher authority, whatever that might be. Sometimes some sins were reserved to the bishop of the diocese, some were reserved to the Holy See, depending on the seriousness of the crime, the seriousness of the, of the delict in question. Uh, so it is actually mentioned that Mark Bach mentions uh, something that confessors must not do in hearing confessions. It is oh, it's a one way of breaking the seal of confession would be to come outside of the confessional and look at the list of reserved sins Right, uh, and they argue because that, that's a way of saying one of these maybe is being confessed right now by someone who just walked in. So yeah, that's, uh, that, is, that would be a way of breaking the seal of confession. So indeed, that must not be done. But something that was, something that was done at Eucharistic Congress was to, to give any priest who was there the faculty was to absolve anything. Um, so uh, this, this particular Eucharistic Congress was in London. And uh, also I mentioned earlier that uh, he had gone as uh, an apprentice in the congregation of uh, ecclesiastical uh, affairs by the time, that the, well, the same year anyway, that he was admitted as an apprentice into the congregation of ecclesiastical affairs that he went to London in 1901 for the funeral of, of Queen Victoria. So he's definitely, uh, he's, he, he, he's from, somewhat familiar with the scene there at this point, and now goes for Eucharistic Congress. So, uh, contrary to what I said last time, actually, Tsar Nicholas II was not there. Uh, there were the, the German emperor was there, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm was there, being his usual very colorful character. <laughs> you can read stories about that. Uh, but it was a very interesting collection of, of all of these people throughout uh, Europe, very high nobility, monarchs, all of whom were related one way or another to Queen Victoria. Though Tsar Nicholas II was actually, uh, contrary to also what I said last time, was actually related to Queen Victoria by marriage. Uh, his wife was a, a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. So, um, he goes to, he goes there for the Eucharistic Congress in 1908. He goes there three years later for the coronation of King George V. So, Edward VII didn't last all that long, all things considered. He lasted about 10 years as king. And then uh, King George V 
was crowned king in 1911, who looks very much like uh, Tsar Nicholas II. They, they definitely were related. And in fact, you see a, there are pictures, there's a, there's a famous photograph of the two of them standing together in German uh, military uniforms, and you can scarcely tell who is who. <laughs> they were very similar. Uh, they were, they, uh, all of those, those, uh, those ruling families of Europe uh, around this time were all related to Queen Victoria. And yet also uh, the Kaiser and the Kaiser Wilhelm II and Tsar Nicholas II were, uh, they, they would sometimes meet personally and uh, uh, very famously in the lead up to the outbreak of the First World War, they exchanged official telegrams, uh, signing them Nicky and Willie, <laughs> because they, that's, how, that's how much they were on a first name basis. Yeah, it was interesting because those were official, that was official correspondence, signing them by these, by their, by their nicknames. Uh, but that is, uh, they, the two of them definitely wanted to avoid war, but really things, to a very great extent, uh, were outside of their own control, to a very great extent. In fact, at one point, the Kaiser even said, well, it seems, it seems that uh, we, can, uh, we, can avoid, uh, we can avoid war. It was either with France, it must have been, it was one or the other, I can't recall at the moment which it was, but uh, he told his chief of the chief of staff of the German army that, well, right, deploy the troops to the other front. And the answer was, we can't do that. We've been planning for so long to fight the war this way. Uh, we can't just call off our plans. There's mo most likely, I'd have to check it, but most likely that was in reference to the, the famous Schlieffen plan, which had been planned for at least uh, 10 plus years at that point. Uh, so uh, things were very much outside of their control at that point, though they did want to avoid war. But George V was the king of England and also the uh, emperor of India. Uh, during this time, during the First World War. And so his was a momentous reign, and definitely by this time the British monarchs were a little more than figureheads, but he was you know, the, the British monarch during this, uh, to call it a momentous time is probably an understatement, but he was king during indeed this period of tremendous upheaval, turmoil, and changes the, whose effects, with whose effects we are living to this day. So Pacelli's intellectual ability and broad knowledge of church law was clearly recognized not only in the Vatican, uh, Italy, and Europe, but even across the Atlantic in the United States as well. His enhanced reputation led the rector of the Catholic University of America to invite Pacelli to become professor of Roman law at the Pontifical University in Washington, D.C. So they, I know that the Catholic University of America is still there today. It's known for being horribly modernist, it was always liberal, and it was, they were, uh, it was infested with uh, Americanism in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. It was, it was always a problematic place, the Catholic University of America. Uh, problematic as it was, it was also uh, prestigious, so to be offered this position of teaching Roman law there, that, that's, a, that's a high offer. That's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a high praise in a way for him to be offered that. He didn't actually accept it, but he was offered that. Also a note on this, Roman law versus uh, English law. So the foundation of the American legal system is, is founded on English law, which includes not only you have a set of laws, rules that have to be followed, but also this will be, um, precedent that must also be observed, sometimes known as case law. Uh, but that means that when a decision has been made, uh, in a certain case, that that must be observed then in other similar cases in the future. So sometimes, uh, you know, talk of lawyers, if, okay, we can't get, we, we can't make an argument too well based on any, any statute law. So you have the distinction between statutory law and case law, that is, say, the rules that are actually on the books and the decisions that have been handed down in various different cases, case law. And, uh, and that's, that's English system, that's the English legal system, which is on uh, which the American system is also based, whereas in Roman law, the uh, precedent case law is, but it's simply not a thing. You have just the, the, the rules to follow and those are to be applied. Yeah, you might have the solutions to different cases on record, but it doesn't have the sense, it never referred to that as case law in the Roman legal system. So that, that, that's what you mean to say in uh, Roman law. So instead, he taught international law and ecclesiastical diplomacy at the School for Papal Diplomats in Rome, and did so willingly from 1909 to 1914. 
In 1912, his cooperation with Benigni brought him dividends, and he was appointed to replace him as Assistant Secretary of the Congregation of Extraordinary Ecclesiastical Affairs, or being made, in effect, the Secretary of the Vatican Foreign Office. And two years later, uh, he assumed the direction of this important congregation as its secretary. So uh, he was also long an advocate of concretizing and legalizing liberty and rights of the church by formal accord, as Pacelli was, so he was sent by St. Pius X to negotiate a concordat with the Kingdom of Serbia, in which there were Catholics living. So Serbia was uh, very much a, a nation that was, in fact, interested in empire building. So at this time, and looking at uh, Serbia in the 1910s leading up to 1914, and then during the First World War, the the, the impression you tend to get is of a, a small nation being trampled on by, by Austria, or Austria attempting to trample on it, but uh, failing, and only finally being put down once the, the Germans invaded uh, the country in 1915. The fact of the matter is that, uh, that there was an awful lot of revolutionary uh, sentiment going around, an awful lot of revolutionary ideology in Serbia, and they were, had a tremendous interest in empire building. Uh, they had many centuries earlier been conquered by the Turks. For a long time, Serbia, or Serbs, had been part of the Ottoman Empire. For a long time, uh, the Turkish Empire had actually really bordered the Austrian Empire. So all of that territory there, Greece included, all of that was all ruled by the Ottoman Empire. And uh, in fact, what we have here, uh, shown as still being part of the Turkish Empire, had receded still further. This map is from 1899, as I recall. But even by 1914, it had receded still further. So pieces were flying off of the Turkish Empire left and right. It was very much the sick man of Europe, as it was called. And Serbia was very much interested in expanding, bringing back its, its empire from centuries ago. And so they, they pursued that um, very zealously. And um, uh, having within its borders the Kingdom of Serbia, the idea of being being to, to form eventually the uh, Kingdom of, of Yugoslavia, which came into existence after the First World War. So really, ultimately, they, they got what they wanted. Uh, but they were uh, very, very much uh, interested in that. And there were also Catholics living within this uh, this kingdom of Serbia, this was relatively recently brought back kingdom of Serbia. And so in order to provide for the good of souls there, uh, St. Pius X sends Pacelli to negotiate a concordat with that kingdom. And the agreement that, in fact, Pacelli concluded provided a number of guarantees for the church, but antagonized the Austrians and was therefore deemed counterproductive by some. So remember, yes, uh, pieces of the Austrian Empire or the pieces of the Turkish Empire are flying off and other powers are, are grabbing it. So Serbia wants to grab territory. Bulgaria, in fact, grabbed further territory. You see uh, Bulgaria right there had expanded southwards by the time of the outbreak of the First World War. They had absorbed some of it. Austria had absorbed Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is right there. In fact, it was in a city in that territory that uh, the event that a month later, oddly enough, sparked, finally sparked the war that took place, which was the assassination of the Archduke. So all of these powers are all, that, that was a very contentious area. And it was understood that it could very well happen. They had this, these two alliance systems, which we talked about in some, at some length last year. These two alliance systems in place, it was widely recognized that something could happen in that area which would start a war. Like the, the British um, had, in, among different possible scenarios, for the outbreak of a, of a, of a major European war, the, 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 uh, the Balkan scenario. Right I forget the exact term they had for it, but something like the, the, Balkan, the, the Balkan scenario or the Balkan crisis scenario, something like that, in which something happens, some clash of interest, something bad happens in that area, and then all of a sudden, someone starts, someone invades someone else or attacks somebody else, and all of a sudden, a major war breaks out. Uh, that was uh, a known possibility, and that's, in fact, what happened. Ultimately, perhaps 
Uh, you have to look at what the British actually anticipated. You have to look at their, their records to figure out all of that. But whether or not it, it went exactly according to the way they anticipated, that, that is what happened. So uh, it was assigned, interestingly enough, this Concordat with Serbia on June 24th, 1914, four days before the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand at Sarajevo by a Serb nationalist, which prompted Austria-Hungary to attack Serbia, sparking the First World War. Although uh, Austria delayed for a full month before actually invading Serbia, which is the, the reason that that gave rise to the war. Everybody else had time to process what was going on, all these ultimatums that Austria was making to Serbia, the way that Serbia was responding. Everybody else had time to hear about it, take a, take a position on it, and get ready to fight a war if necessary because of it. Because this was not the first crisis of this kind. There were other major crises, uh, even in recent years before this, which had not broken out, which had not ended up causing a war because they had the crisis had been managed, had, the crisis had been dissipated by before it reached that point. And in fact, that was the hope of uh, the German Kaiser himself personally, uh, that this could similarly be avoided. A war on this occasion could similarly be avoided. He told the Austrians, just, if you're going to do this, just go in and invade the country, take it over, make it so that the only thing anybody has, any, has, has to react to is something that's already done, a fait accompli. Just make it so that, no, that nobody has anything to say about it other than, oh, look what, what just happened. <laughs> Don't allow anybody to get the idea we should stand up for Serbia, because if you stand up for Serbia, you're probably Russia, and if you're uh, if you're in that case, you're probably Russia going then to war with Austria uh, over Serbia, and if that's the case, then automatically France goes to war with Austria. If Austria goes to war with France or or Russia, then Germany's automatically at war with France and Russia. And if Germany goes to war with France, Germany will have to invade Belgium. Belgium gets invaded, Great Britain gets involved, and there you have a war. And that's what happened. So it's all it's all, all quite complicated, and which is what makes that such an interesting conflict. But that was the ugly scenario that unfolded. All uh, well, to a great extent due to the fact that the Austrians delayed. And you, you can read about the, all the complications of the July crisis. So you have this assassination again at the end of June, 1914. And then finally the war breaks out in August because of assassin an assassination that happened in June. You can read about all the complications of the July crisis, which ultimately ended up in the outbreak of war. But th there were reasons why Austria delayed but the Kaiser himself was opposed to it. He said, just go in and, and do it. If you're going to take over that country, do it quickly before anybody has time to react to it, which is exactly what they did not do. So dreading the prospect of a European-wide conflict, the grief-stricken St. Pius X died on August 20th, 1914. So the, the timing of his death, I mean, he was already older and, and, and in poor health, but that seems to have finished him off, uh, the fact that war broke out that month. In early September, Giacomo della Chiesa, who had recently been made a cardinal, became Pope Benedict XV. So I may, we may have talked about this recently, but it is something of a mystery as to why exactly St. Pius X made della Chiesa a cardinal. He was, that was in the final consistory in which he created cardinals before dying. Uh, and the list of, of men to be made cardinals, of ecclesiastics to be made cardinals, uh, had the name of de la Chiesa written on it in St. Pius X's own hand, which is which was confusing because, for one thing, the, the Sodalitium Pianum, St. Pius X's own agency, had a file on de la Chiesa. He had been sent to Bologna to, to be the bishop, the bishop of Bologna, as we said before, in a case of getting kicked upstairs. That was a, a promotion for him technically, but in reality it just got him off the scene because he was known to be... Uh, Rather liberal. Uh, the only uh, so it is a mystery. Why did the Saint Pius X then make him a cardinal? Not only any cardinal, but the cardinal who was then elected. And uh, can only speculate as to why what exactly he may have been thinking. But it may have been that he saw that this election, this conclave, was due for a swing back to the the accommodationists, back to the politicanti, and figured that oh, well, there are others I really don't want to see elected. So if I make Della Chiesa a cardinal, he might be the one and be the the least problematic. That may have been his thought. As far as I know, he never said or wrote anything to that effect, but it's possible. 
so elected. He was elected for his diplomatic expertise, as as Pacelli would later be, uh, and emerged Benedict XV did as an advocate for peace on a war torn continent. So we won't go into all of that this year, as, as we already did that last year. But the extent to which Benedict XV made efforts to bring an end to the war as quickly as possible. Uh, in, in 1917, he made some pretty strenuous efforts to do that. Uh, you may remember talking about the, the, the dinner at which, in fact, Pacelli uh, presented to the Kaiser a, a plan for, uh, formulated by Benedict XV, uh, a basis on which to end the war and, and achieve a state of peace. Uh, which was rejected by everybody rejected ultimately Benedict XV's uh, proposals. The Allen just rejected them completely. Uh, and there were cries, uh, we cannot accept in France, we cannot accept your peace, Holy Father. And it was, it was, everything was just worked up to an absolute frenzy. After three years of this almost constant bloodletting, nobody wanted to give up without gaining something. So everything was just in it, just upheaval, chaos, turmoil, use whatever term you want. Everything was just upside down. The world, the world was just, just turning in on itself and devouring itself at that point. Uh, everything was just collapsing completely. And uh, Benedict XV was just really trying to bring an end to that, and nobody paid attention to it. Even the Kaiser was personally interested and personally agreed to it, but his own, uh, during that very same dinner, you may also remember that uh, generals, uh, uh, General Ludendorff and may have been a marshal, but uh, uh, Paul von Hindenburg, the, the ones who were running the German war effort, sent in their resignations at that point because they didn't want any part of this. So the Kaiser backed out of it and they kept, they kept on running the war. Because remember, the, the, something to keep in mind about the, the German Empire, and that is, yes, there was an emperor uh, in charge of everything, had all these kingdoms, so all of the, the German Empire that you see listed there is, in fact, still a collection of different kingdoms. Uh, all held together by this imperial government on which the king of Prussia was was sitting, you know, re uh, presiding over the whole thing as the emperor of of the Second Reich. That was known as the Second Reich, the first being the Holy Roman Empire. This was the Second Reich. That was their idea. And then, uh, uh, but in, in that whole system, things were not very well defined. Who exactly has what function was never all that clear. So, for example, when Bismarck was around, he was the chancellor of the empire, and he was the one effectively running things until, well, also interestingly, Wilhelm II got rid of him, practically first thing. Probably the best thing he ever did, but got rid of him. So you had these people who could come up into positions of power, in some cases of nearly total power, being effectively dictators, as General Ludendorff became in effect, uh, but uh, without having any official title to that and could get rid of, could be gotten rid of very easily by the emperor. So you do have this whole, it is a very uh, highly unpredictable, the situation could develop in very different ways uh, because General Ludendorff was the uh, effective, uh, officially he was the quartermaster general for the, the organization that was the German general staff. That was his position. He wasn't even technically chief of staff. His position was quartermaster general, but he ended up being not only the commander of the military, but running the entire nation. And the, the Kaiser became more and more a marginal figure. But not completely a figurehead because he eventually got rid of Ludendorff when things really went south. So it was not a well-defined scenario. So you could have the situation in which the Kaiser agrees to something, but his generals to whom he's effectively given total control don't want it, and so he backs out of it because of that. He could get rid of them, but he doesn't want to because of uh, the way, because of circumstances. So it was a whole confusing thing. But anyway, we saw the details of that last year, the extent to which Benedict XV was uh, heavily invested in uh, bringing peace to Europe. So Cardinal uh, Gaspari uh, became uh, Benedict XV's Secretary of State and the 38-year-old Monsignor Eugenio Pacelli served as Secretary of the Congregation for Ecclesiastical Affairs, a post analogous to that of Under Secretary of State. Uh, Benedict XV, no less than his two immediate predecessors, appreciated and had recourse to Pacelli's widely recognized competence. And uh, Benedict XV was elected on 
September 3rd, 1914, which, and interestingly enough, anybody know what date that is now? Yes. St. Pius X. Yes, that is now the feast day of St. Pius X, interestingly enough. Uh, but that was the day in which Benedict the Fifteenth was elected, too late to take any step to prevent the outbreak of war, clearly. Uh, the new pope called upon both Gaspari and Pacelli to help preserve papal neutrality and to assist him, the, the pope, in the onerous task of restoring tranquility to the continent, which was no small responsibility. And it turned out to be impossible, ultimately. Before, anyway, the, uh, before things had been fought out on the battlefield. So... Uh, this is also something you generally see, that uh, unless there's a case of one side clearly being right and another clearly being wrong, the church doesn't get involved in conflicts. Especially at this time, you may remember from the, the program of the Sodalitium Pianum that we studied last year, uh, one of the things that the, uh, the Sodalitium enunciated among its principles is that no nation has the right simply to pursue its own interests without any regard to the rights of any other nations or any other person, and simply pursue its own interests in an animalistic manner. Uh, that was very much exactly what was happening at the time. That was this whole, this whole war broke out because, precisely because of that. In fact, you, uh, it's a book I read from last year in class, um, which, in fact, read the account of the assassination of the Archduke, Franz Ferdinand, uh, the book title of the book was called called The Sleepwalkers, and so called because uh, the author even explains at a certain point that it's because everybody was just pursuing his own interests with little to no thought of what might come about as a result of this. What might, what kind of monster might we bring into existence by doing what we're doing here? And everybody just shunned responsibility. Even after the war, nobody was willing to take responsibility for having started this catastrophe, this absolute cataclysm. Uh, nobody was willing to take responsibility for it. They all just, oh, I'm just pursuing, I'm just doing my job here. I'm just pursuing my own interests. I'm just trying to protect my perhaps overseas empire or my territorial integrity, or in some cases, I'm, I'm seeking revenge. Uh, all of that, it was all, all those kinds of things came together to cause that war. And so the, the, the point being that there was, it was a, uh, rather unclear situation. Who might be right here or who might be wrong? It could be very difficult to say in such a situation. And, uh, and there's no clue that the interests of the church were not clearly aligned with one side or the other, so the idea of the church is then to stay out of this. There are Catholics and the army is on both sides. Uh, so the, the church is not going to take a stand in a situation which is unclear anyway, in which there are Catholics and the armies of both, both alliances. So the vast majority of the Vatican's diplomatic experts concurred with Benedict XV, Gaspardi, and Pacelli uh, that impartiality was the only policy that the Vicar of Christ should pursue, certainly in this case. So really, uh, the Crusades, of course, were wars, in fact, called by popes, uh, but such things are, uh, since the Crusades, are practically, if not completely unheard of, then almost entirely unheard of. Can't think of any other cases of the church actively encouraging the taking up of arms since then. So 1917, Pacelli was dispatched by Pope Benedict XV to Bavaria as nuncio and entrusted him with the delicate task of gaining support, German support, for the papal peace effort. So again, he's the nuncio to Bavaria, uh, Bavaria still being a kingdom within the German Empire. In fact, to the point that uh, Bavarians still very much had their own interests. There, there are actually accounts of, uh, during the war, uh, there were very famously the, the trench lines which extended across Belgium and uh, northeastern France from really from Switzerland all the way up to the North Sea. So it was a very long line of entrenchments that just sat there for four years. And uh, so there are all kinds of interesting stories that uh, come out of that. But one of them was actually the, uh, an English soldier saying that uh, at one point they were facing Bavarians on their, their section of the line, and uh, the Bavarians warned them that we're, we're going out and Prussians are coming in, and they're really nasty, so be careful. <laughs> Somehow they managed to get that message across. But they said, we like the, 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 the even the British soldiers were saying, we like the Bavarians much more than the Prussians. Uh, there, there, were, there, were very, there, there could be very different peoples even within Germany. And there was at one point that uh, some, there was actually a, 
the crown prince, uh, the crown prince of Bavaria, prince uh, uh, was in was in charge. It was either it was either he or sorry, no, I think it was uh, Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria. It was not a crown prince, but he was in charge of an army facing uh, on the border of, of France and Germany, and uh, the idea was well, we need troops to go defend Prussia in the east from Russian forces. And they refused to go. We're not going to defend Prussia. <laughs> we have to defend our own territory, which is Bavaria. Why are we going? Why would you send us to defend Prussia? So no, we're not doing it. So they very much had their own interests. So it's an idea of the situation here. Yes, you do have on on the map at this point a very definite, uh, on paper, monolithic German Empire. But it still, in fact, is made up of states that existed before, have existed for a long time before. So Pacelli was stationed in Munich. The, uh, in Bavaria from 1917 to 1925, and thereafter in Berlin from 1925 to 1929. So a long career then as uh, top diplomat in, in Germany, in different parts of Germany. In 1920, he was accredited as Apostolic Nuncio to the Weimar Republic. So the Weimar Republic was the, the German government that came into place after the collapse of the of the, of the monarchy, of the German Empire. So that was dissolved, the, the German Empire. The Second Reich lasted, therefore, from 19, or 1870 or 1871 until uh, 1918 or 1919 with the uh, Versailles Treaty, which uh, uh, was a, uh, very much a revolutionary thing to this extent that it brought about the end of various dynasties. So we talked a couple of years ago about all of the Napoleonic Wars uh, how, about how many times Napoleon defeated everybody he fought. And in none of those cases did he ever cause the collapse of a, of a monarchy. He never demanded the abdication and renunciation to the throne of any nation on the part of any royal family anywhere. That was not the way things were done. There was enough common sense that even on the part of Napoleon that you don't do that to a, a great and powerful and perhaps very proud nation. You don't humiliate it to such an extent that they will be excited with sentiments of revenge against you forever. And even eventually, Napoleon himself was taken out. The Allies, all the other nations who fought against him, in 1814, they demanded, you, he has to go. And it was the only condition in which they would accept peace terms. And all, to the point that all of Napoleon's marshals, many of them, stood up to him. Men he had set up as marshals, they said. You have to go. You have to abdicate. For the good of France, you have to go. And he did. But even then, uh, that was the only target they had. Napoleon himself has to go. He is the troublemaker here. He has to go. Uh, but they did not impose crushing war debts on France or seize huge amounts of French territory. They left it as it was. Uh, they didn't take anything from them. In fact, even uh, if you check the date, but they, they left them their pre-revolutionary borders. So they, let, they did not crush... France as a nation. Got rid of Napoleon, personally, which was not a bad idea, <laughs> but, but they did not crush France as a nation. Whereas, and that was more or less what the, the Germans and Austrians were expecting at the end of the First World War when it was clear they couldn't win, uh, that the, the weight of the millions of American troops showing up on the Western Front was something that they were not going to be able to overcome. Uh, they saw, okay, we can't win this, uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to have a peace treaty, now we're willing to negotiate. There was an idea we'll have a normal peace treaty, and okay, we technically lost, but we'll you know, have to pay some reparations, maybe give up some territory, but after that, everything will be normal, normal peace treaty. No, this time, the demand, the demands were made. The German emperor must go, and not only he personally must go, but his empire must be dissolved and broken up. The Austrian Empire broken up even more. So if you look at this area now that is the, uh, this whole expanse of territory that was once the Austrian Empire. Now Austria is just like, that section up there, and, uh, and that, that north, that north uh, maybe further south, not quite that far north. But Austria is just a very small portion of that. Uh, all of those are all different nations. Like, Romania absorbed a big chunk of it. Uh, but this idea of demanding the downfall of a whole monarchy and a dissolution of its empire and a complete and total rearranging of, of, the, of the entire scene to that extent, and Napoleon rearranged the scene of Europe, uh, the map of Europe many times, but uh, to that extent, to the, the point of really uh, uprooting, getting rid of royal families, whole, whole dynasties and their entire empires, bringing an end to 
empires, uh, see, the Austrian Empire had been around for centuries, all of that, uh, that, was, uh, that, was a, that was a new thing. That was revolutionary. T today, it might not sound so strange to us because regime changes and overthrows happen. Uh, we've heard so much about that in recent decades that you know, demanding the downfall of the, this or that government might not sound so strange. But at the time, that was, that was a, uh, extremely harsh. And also at the end of that war, uh, Germany was well, very famously uh, humiliated terribly, just absolutely crushed with war debt. Its army, its military, severely limited in every way. And that was uh, we'll see we'll see how the how the Church um, uh, Benedict XV said certain things about it. Pacelli said certain things about it. Cardinal Gaspari said certain things about it. Uh, none of them favorable to the way Germany was treated at the end of that. But the Weimar Republic was what emerged from the ashes of the of the German Empire, really a, a, a socialist republic. So all that came in very quickly, and there was there was turmoil everywhere. They really created a power vacuum uh, with the, the monarchy gone. So the first years of Pacelli's tenure were crucial ones in Europe, to say the least, and witnessed the end of the First World War, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, which inspired revolutions in Central Europe and Germany, the Treaty of Versailles and the tormented birth of the federal Weimar Republic from the ashes of the German Empire. So uh, is the irony of the whole thing was that all of that, um, that revolutionary, all that revolutionary socialism had been coming from Russia. And you may know that it was the Germans actually who sent Lenin back to Russia. They took him out of his exile in Zurich, Switzerland, and sent him back to Russia with the idea of causing problems. So the Germans were really into that during the war. They were into causing all kinds of problems at home for their, uh, for their opponents. For example, they fomented, they, they were very much involved in uh, troubles in Ireland during the war. They were, in fact, the British captured a, a submarine full of German weapons that were being sent to revolutionaries in Ireland. So their idea was, well, it causes much trouble for the British in their own territories, because Ireland is 100% as it is here. On this map, that was all part of the United Kingdom at that point, all of Ireland, not just the northern part, but the whole thing. The idea was cause trouble for the British at home, keep as many British troops tied down, keeping things quiet in Ireland, where they will be busy instead of fighting us in France. That was the idea. And the idea of sending Lenin back to Russia was not that he would succeed, the Germans were not interested in seeing a, a communist state emerge anywhere. Their idea was just let's but send uh, a revolutionary back to Russia who will cause trouble for, for the Russians, and uh, they'll have to, they'll, they'll be distracted by that. Maybe, maybe there'll be some problems about this, and some troops, of the Russian army was never much of a problem for the Germans. But it'll cause as much trouble at home for them as possible. They'll take away from whatever's left of their war effort. They were not expecting to happen what actually happened, which was that when it actually succeeded, in a, to an extent, the Soviet Union was always a disaster. But uh, he succeeded in as much as he brought about a communist government in the country, which then, of course, spread its ideology everywhere. German troops even coming back from Russia, there are stories that they were being transferred from Russia to for the big German offensive in 1918 in France, that they brought a lot of that stuff with them. And then that spread throughout Germany. And there was, uh, there was a lot of wars breed discontent, definitely. And a lot that was spreading everywhere. I mean, Germany was having major, major food problems. Um, you may notice on this map that Germany doesn't have all that much coastline that can get out. So all of this right here that Germany has, that's all, that was all very easily blockaded by the Royal Navy. Uh, a blockade which actually lasted past the end of the war itself. Uh, and then the, uh, Winston Churchill was first lord of the Admiralty. He said, the, the purpose of this blockade is to starve the entire nation. And they made no secret of that. So striving to preserve impartiality, Benedict XV indicated that the well-being of the troubled continent rested on a fair treatment of Germany and a just peace. And uh, I can only say that subsequent history could not have proved him more emphatically correct. Uh, Pacelli shared this conviction, so all it really took was some common sense to see it, at the same time, the Pope urged the Allies to end their blockade of Germany, which we said was continuing past the end of the war, which burdened civilians, and to abandon their plans to condemn the Kaiser and his leading officials as war criminals. Now, definitely the German army perpetrated atrocities in some places, but those atrocities were definitely exaggerated. Uh, all kinds of horrible stories about things they did in Belgium. Um, 
uh, raping nuns and throwing babies onto bayonets and things like that. And there was one, I believe it was an American journalist who, who offered, essentially made a bet and offered some large amount of money to anybody who could give him proof of any of that stuff, and nobody took him up on it. Uh, so uh, d definitely, there, there was an, as in every case of, of wartime propaganda, there was definitely exaggeration going on. Uh, but the Germans did actually perpetrate uh, uh, atrocities. But uh, you know, uh, that, that there's, there's plenty of that on every side in a war. Uh, the blockade of Germany was you know, targeting the civilian population. There's no question of that. Uh, so the, the, the Kaiser was not uh, finally convicted as a war criminal and condemned to death. He, just, he lived out the rest of his life in, uh, as, a, as an exile in Holland, uh, or uh, in exile in Holland. He was never put to death. He died of old age in the early days, the early years of the Second World War. Uh, but uh, there, actually, he even wrote to Hitler at one point asking him to reestablish the, the German monarchy. But Hitler, the Nazis in general, had no use for that. And Hitler responded something to the effect of, well, what an idiot. <laughs> he got the letter from the Kaiser asking him to do that. So he had, they had, Nazis had absolutely no use for, for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the Kaiser. Uh, it was a, really, they blamed him. Remember, Hitler was uh, a, a corporal in the German army on the Western Front. Uh, and uh, as, as the German army generally did, blamed civilian leaders, such as the Kaiser, most of all the Kaiser, for their defeat, that they were not properly supported by the, by the home front. That they, they blamed them to a great degree. So in... in uh, the Papal Secretary of State, uh, mentioned before, is Cardinal Gaspardi, warned that if Germany were not given a reasonable peace, it would become a Bolshevik ally and imitate Russia. And his prediction proved prophetic to a great extent. In 1918 and 1919, a series of communist-inspired uprisings, in fact, erupted in Germany. So, yeah, it, all it took was some common sense, which was rather lacking in certain circles uh, by this point. Actually, it was the reason why, the main reason why Germany was crushed the way it was at the end of the war was because of France, specifically Georges Clemenceau, who was uh, just an absolutely horrible human being. Uh, but he was, uh, he was the French premier, the prime minister at the end of the war, and he was the one who wanted to see all that happen. And uh, David Lloyd George, the British prime minister, even Woodrow Wilson, the highly uh, detached from reality president of the United States, uh, they were they were they were saying well, it's not be too hard on them and this will drive them to seek revenge but Clemenceau had wanted none of it he was the one who insisted on all that and ultimately got his way was so fixed on revenge against Germany that he said he wanted to be buried standing up uh, facing Germany that was the extent to which he was fixated on revenge and that's really the, the nucleus we talk about those two we've talked a great deal about those two alliance systems that ultimately caused the war, that uh, along whose lines the war ultimately broke out, at the nucleus of all of that was a French de determination to ha get its revenge on Germany for its defeat in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 to 1871. The humiliation involved in that, the downfall of its second empire, Napoleon III, was captured by the Prussians in the course of it, and also the loss of Alsace-Lorraine, all of that was inspired in, in France this desire to get revenge on Germany at whatever cost. So uh, that's, it was, that, that was the nucleus of it, and that clearly hadn't gone away by the end of the war. Uh, so that was, that was the reason why ultimately that Germany was crushed the way it was. But to add insult to injury, the Germans were constrained to acknowledge their responsibility for the conflict in the war guilt clause while Article 227 of the treaty sought the trial of the Kaiser and his officials. So this is easily the most famous clause of the, of the Versailles Treaty to the effect that uh, uh, had to do with the, the German payments, their war reparations, which you see, would uh, have a total of 132 billion gold marks. Um, the one estimate I saw in 2019 dollars anyway was $500 billion. Uh, that was the amount of money that Germany was required to pay. At the end of a war, wars are extremely expensive and costly in every way. And that was the amount that Germany was going to be forced to pay. So the, the war go clause was, oh yes, Germany must pay these reparations because of the war that it uh, brought upon the, um, 
the, the allied nations, in, in essence. So forces, they have to sign on the bottom line, they have to, they, have, they have, were given no choice. Their choices were either to take full responsibility or go back to fighting the war, which they were in no position to do. So that, that is easily seen as, the, as, a, as a major wrong done to Germany to force them to accept that. 